سلام 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 Bismillah, alhamdulillah, assalamu alaikum, which means peace be unto you. Welcome to another episode of The Deen Show. You want to know about Islam, you've come to the right place. You want to know about Muslims, you've come to the source. Our next guest is the author of some very unique books. We're going to be talking to him. We're going to be talking about how he came to Islam. Sit tight, you don't want to go nowhere with our next guest coming up, Dr. Brown. We'll be right back on The Deen Show. Salam and 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 my pleasure. So my pleasure Dr. Brown or Officer Brown? No, no, Dr. Brown. Okay. Yeah. So the people, uh, our audience, uh, just got to read a little bit about you. Why don't you just briefly tell us, they got to see that you had graduated, you're a doctor, you're an officer, a retired uh, major in the uh, Air Force, is this correct? Tell us a little right. bit about this. Well, I don't know if you re really can say retired because that, in most people's minds, means that they spent 20 years in the military. Yeah. I was 16 years, eight years in active reserves and eight years active duty. But uh, the bottom line is that I'm an ophthalmologist. I'm a, a specialist in cataract and refractive surgery. I'm the medical director of a major eye center. Um, during the last 10 years, I've authored a number of books uh, about Islam. I first became Muslim about uh, 14 years ago, and uh, in the first uh, in the first few years, uh, it was just accelerated learning. Uh, I got to a point where I realized that there was basically um, an absence of literature uh, with regard to certain subjects, and I felt that 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 void needed to be filled, and that's what started me on writing. So over the last 10 years. I wrote a series of five books. Uh, many readers might know the first one. It's called The First and Final Commandment. Uh, however, I've now rewritten that into two books. One is called Misguided, and the other is called, called Got It. Those are basically volumes one and volumes two of The First and Final Commandment. Um, the latest book, the one I'm most excited about, is The Eighth Scroll. And the reason that I'm excited, and I feel others should be as well, is that that's actually an action adventure. It's a novel. And uh, it's a very exciting, very fast paced book. And uh, it's a book that people will read because they enjoy it. But at the same time, they'll take home a deeper message. Uh, now, so that's about it. let's talk about people are excited because you mentioned the word excited. I'm sure they're excited to hear how you came to Islam. Talk about this, talk about your past religious experiences and what led you to Islam. Sure. Uh, actually, you know, it's, uh, it's kind of a fun topic for me um, because most people assume that I was Christian before I became Muslim. Mm -hmm. And I have to correct them. I have to tell them, no, um, I, I was trying very hard to be a Christian. I had tried for many years to be a Christian in many different ways, and it just never worked out for me. And I get a lot of funny looks when I say that. Um, but the, the bottom line is that what happened was that uh, I started on a, a spiritual search uh, about 19 years ago. I had a daughter who was born with, a, uh, with what, what's called a coarctation of the aorta. It's a, uh, it's a lethal problem, meaning that a child born with this condition most often dies. And they, they usually die in a particularly bad way, meaning that they have open heart surgery and then a few years later they repeat the open heart surgery and then a few years later they repeat it as the child is growing they have to increase the size of the graft and in the end these children die so this was the first time when I got the news uh, of her condition this is the first time in my life I felt I had no control I, I couldn't do anything about this situation All, every time before in my life when there was a problem I dealt with it on my own. If I needed more money, I worked harder. 
if this needed fixing, I found somebody or I fixed it myself, et cetera, et cetera. And everybody knows what I'm talking about. When this baby was born, her name was Hannah, she went straight to the intensive care unit. Her body from here down was almost the color of my suit, closer to the color of your suit, just kind of a, a dusky gunmetal blue because her body was not getting oxygen. Her body was literally starving in front of our eyes. Uh, oxygen starved in front of our eyes. And, and that part of her body was, was literally dying. And uh, when I saw that, like I said, it was the first time in my life that I needed to turn to some uh, greater power. Um, I was atheist up until then. I had been raised in a family that was basically Quaker, one of the Protestant sects, but not practicing. And I myself had never taken on any religion. So I had to leave the intensive care unit because they brought in a team of doctors, a team of specialists in the field. And uh, while they were doing their thing, I just went to the prayer room. And f for the first time in my life, I really prayed. And I prayed kind of the typical atheist prayer. There's a, there's a prayer called uh, the prayer of the skeptic. The prayer of the skeptic goes like this. Oh God, if there is a God, save my soul if I have a soul. Yeah. Okay, that's the prayer of the skeptic. Uh, and most atheists, when they pray, they pray in this way. They say, oh God, if you are there, you know, because they're not quite sure. And uh, that's basically what I prayed. I just said, oh God, if you're there, I don't know if you're there or not, but if you are, I need help. And uh, I made a promise to my creator on that day. I promised that if he would save the life of my child, and then guide me to the religion that was most pleasing to him uh, that I would follow. And that was the, that was the simple promise. And, I, and uh, I was only away for maybe about 15 minutes, 15 or 20 minutes, but when I went back into the intensive care unit, my daughter was on the other side of, of the intensive care unit. And when I entered the door and looked across the room, the doctors raised their faces from my, from my daughter and I could see right away something had changed. Uh, their faces were mystified, as if they didn't really understand what was going on, maybe a little bit shocked. Uh, when, uh, when I walked up to them, they simply told me that she was going to be okay and um, that she wouldn't, uh, you know, she wouldn't die. And uh, sure enough, she went back to being a completely normal child in all respects. I mean, you know, normal quirks, but, but completely healthy. She didn't have surgery. She didn't need medication. Um, just uh, her condition completely reversed. And here's the thing. We had, we had an ultrasound film of her heart beforehand. And we had an ultrasound film of her heart after. And before, she had the problem I told you about. After, it was completely gone, stone cold normal. And the doctors, I remember the doctors sort of went through an explanation, trying to make sense of it to me, trying to make sense of it to themselves. And I feel that they bought that explanation, but I remember standing there looking at them just thinking, you know, I know that explanation works for you, but it just doesn't work for me. I mean, that's, I mean, I pray, prayed this prayer. And I just have to believe that this was the hand of my creator. So I knew he had made good on his promise and I had to make good on mine. So that started me on a religious search. And uh, I, was, I thought I would find the truth in Christianity. I studied Judaism first. That led me to studying Christianity. I thought I'd find the truth there for years, years. I tried to convince myself I tried to become Christian. I mean, I went to Seventh-day Adventist, Mormon, Quaker, Southern Baptist, Roman Catholic, Greek Orthodox. I, I don't know exactly how many different uh, sects, how many different churches I went to trying to find the truth of Christianity. And I always kept coming up against the same thing. I always kept liking some part of it, but having trouble with others. And when it came down to the tenets of faith, I would talk to the priests and I would say, well, how about this? And they couldn't explain it. And how about that? And they couldn't explain that. And well, what about this? 
they'd kind of shrug their shoulders, and I'd just say, well, you know, thanks anyway, and move on to the next congregation. Um, it wasn't until I found Islam that all of my questions were answered, and it wasn't until uh, I found Islam that peace entered my heart, and I realized that this was where all of the pieces of the puzzle uh, came together. What were some of these, I'm sure the viewers want to know, what were some of these questions that you had that weren't, uh, they weren't able to answer when you were going to some of these higher-ups in the uh, church? Well, you'll find, you'll find these as central themes in my books, uh, but the simplest ones were, uh, were simply that I didn't find foundation to the tenets of faith, okay? I, for, for example, uh, the Trinity. Uh, it is not mentioned anywhere in the Bible. You, nowhere do you find the word Trinity. Um, it was a doctrine that was derived 300 years after the time of Jesus. And in my simple mind, I just thought, well, if this were a true doctrine, you would have thought that Jesus Christ would have spoken about it explicitly. So I'd, I would ask for justification. You know, how do the Christians justify um, the concept of the Trinity? And they would always go to uh, certain passages, you know, where Jesus was quoted as having said, you know, I and the Father are one, or uh, there are three on earth, you know, the, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And uh, I, I would say, okay, fine, that's written in the Bible, but here are the arguments that cancel those. You know, for example, the Trinitarian formula, the strongest evidence is, is this quotation about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and that is not written in the original manuscripts. That was a marginal note that was written by a scribe into the, into the margin of one of the manuscripts, which was later copied into the, uh, into the scripture. And uh, so I would point this out to priests. And, uh, you know, the frustrating thing is I would talk to them and they would finish the sentence for me. I, I would say, this thing that you just told me, it's not in the scripture. It was a margin, and they would say, a marginal note added by a scribe. Yeah, okay, we know that. Okay, uh, well, the next point is, and I'd be thinking, subhanAllah, if you know this is not the Bible, if you know that it's in insertion, an illegitimate insertion. Why are you preaching it as if it's gospel truth? Um, there are many instances like this, and you can read about this in my books, but one of, the, one of the biggest things that disturbed me was that I believed in Jesus Christ as a man and as a prophet. So I would ask them, prove to me where Jesus Christ is God, or even a son of God. Mm -hmm. And again, we would, we would go through that explanation, they would, uh, they would say their piece, and I would say, look, 88 times in the Bible, 88 times, Jesus Christ calls himself the Son of Man. Yes. Nowhere does he call himself the Son of God. Nowhere. Now, there are a couple of places where it's mistranslated, mm -hmm. or it's spoken of metaphorically, but that is very different from literal meaning. And I, I just pointed out, that out to them. I said, you know, this place here, this is metaphorical. Mm -hmm. This place here, this is mistranslation. And again, they, they would finish the sentences for me. They'd say, yeah, yeah, okay, we know it's taken out of context and so on. And I'd be looking at them thinking, well, you know, who's, who's the one who's supposed to know the scripture here? You know, I'm a novice at this. They're a priest. Um, so, so now if somebody didn't do his homework like you did, you can see how some, we can see how somebody can kind of get led in a way that they want to lead that individual? You know, uh, exactly. I mean, I, I think that the Bible itself is, it's difficult to understand. Mm -hmm. um, but there, there are some very simple lessons that I think people can take home of it. And it's stressing those lessons, I think, that brings out the truth. One of the, one of the central lessons to me was that you have to make a choice. Jesus Christ and Paul taught opposite, opposite things. Yes. Now you can, you can rectify this in different ways, but in a nutshell, Jesus Christ taught that God is one. Three times in the New Testament, he is quoted as having said, you know, no Israel, thy, 
thy Lord is one God. Okay, one God. That's what Jesus Christ said. Okay. On the other hand, Paul and the Pauline theologians who followed in his wake developed the concept of the Trinity. That's one point. When it came to the law, Jesus Christ was a rabbi. He followed Old Testament law. That's why we call him Rabbi Jesus. Mm -hmm. He taught Old Testament law. Paul came along and said, it doesn't apply anymore. He canceled the law. Jesus Christ taught that he was the son of man. Others taught that he was the son of God. Mm -hmm. Jesus Christ taught, uh, taught accountability, that everybody is accountable for their own actions. Again, he was an Orthodox Jew. It's written in the Old Testament that no son shall bear the iniquity of his father. No son shall bear his iniquity of the father. And yet the crux of Christianity is that we all bear the sin of Adam. How do you, how do you make these two concepts fit? Well, Paul did it just by saying justifi justification by faith. All you have to do is believe and you will be justified in whatever you do. Okay? And it goes on and it goes on. But the point, the point is that if you take the teachings of Jesus and you take the teachings of Paul, these are opposite. I, I haven't found a single instance where they were the same. And this is why you find Paul and James, the uh, you know, alleged brother of Jesus, uh, at odds with one another in the Bible. And it's also why we in our minds should, should recognize this conflict and make a choice. Mm -hmm. You have to make a choice. If two people are teaching opposite things, you have to choose which one you're going to follow. Yes. Now, I believe, I believe we should choose to follow the prophet. Trinitarian Church, for the last 1,700 years, what they, ha what they have said is take these two teachings, even though they're opposites, and put them together and make them work. Mm -hmm. Jesus said God is one. Paul says God is three. So God is one and he's three. Jesus said the Old Testament law applied. Paul said it was canceled. So we'll take what the last person said. The last person said it's canceled. So we'll kind of, we'll kind of try to make that work against the teachings of Jesus. So I take this, you know? the top part of the suit that fits, the pant don't fit, you know, put it together, it doesn't fit at all. Well, you know, it's different ways of looking at it. Each person has to find their own formula. But, but this is, you know, we're just talking about what happened with me. Yeah. I mean, I just looked at it and said, that doesn't work for me. What works for me is he was a prophet. He's a man. I'm going to believe what he said. Makes I'm sense. not going to believe what the person who canceled his teachings said. And that's, that's why I could never accept Christianity. Dr. Brown, let's kind of reverse. You mentioned atheism and being uh, from a family of Quaker Protestants. I think the majority of people, they can relate to this simple thing as far as uh, being in a Christian household, not practicing Christianity. And you know what? Many people just doing their own thing. And a lot of people probably borderline agnostic. How were you living at that time? Were you just doing your own thing until that moment hit where you found out that I need, you know, uh, I'm not self-sufficient? Talk about this. I was living in the way that I think a lot of um, close Christians live. You know, I mean, people who are close to Christianity, but for one reason or another, they have not fully embraced the tenets of one particular faith. Uh, and that is I, I was living with, with the golden rule, um, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And the opposite of that, of course, is don't do unto others as you would not want them to do to you. Yeah. Uh, so I was basically living according to the golden rule. I was trying to live with as sound principles, as uh, sound moral principles as, as I felt I could. Uh, but I don't think that's such an unusual experience. I think, I think in America, that's probably the majority of people. Uh, I think the majority of people in America are in this position where they have foundational beliefs that they hold on to, but they simply cannot accept the full package of what they're being taught by any particular church. And what I mean by that is just that they may have sound moral values, they may have sound spiritual values, um, they believe in certain fundamental things. They believe, they believe in God. They believe in his prophets, including uh, Abraham and Ishmael, Isaac, Noah, Moses, Jesus. And they see, uh, you know, they see certain truths in the biblical teachings. But then when it comes down to the tenets of Christian faith, 
they find maybe points one and two and three they can accept, but other things they find that they cannot accept. So they're searching. They're searching for how to make sense of all of this. Mm -hmm. And that's the position I was in until I became Muslim. Uh, it was Islam that, to me, made sense of everything. And it was trying to convey that, uh, which was the reason behind my books. I always believed in continuity in the chain of prophethood. I always believed, with, without it needing to be explained to me, I always believed that Moses was a prophet and that Jesus was a prophet. I always believed that. But when I found Moses speaking of three prophets to follow, mm -hmm. and the Jews are still waiting for those three prophets, this is no mystery. And then I found Jesus Christ speaking of one more prophet to follow, it raised a very big question in my mind. Okay, Moses spoke of three prophets to follow. John the Baptist, we have to count as one. Jesus Christ, we have to count as two. And that leaves a third. And then you find Jesus Christ speaking of a final prophet. And a lot of people are going to say, where did he do that? Where did Jesus Christ speak of the final prophet? Read my book and you'll know. But the, the point is, this is why Christianity is a messianic religion. For, for 2,000 years, people have been looking for the completion of the, uh, the prediction. And, uh, and that was the question in my mind. Moses spoke of three, we have two. Jesus spoke of the last one also. Mm -hmm. Who is that last one? When I studied the life of Muhammad, peace be upon him, and when I learned about Islam, that, that fit the niche for me. That made sense. And that, to me, explained the continuity of the chain of revelation up to its completion. Tell us, Dr. Brown, we went from atheism to trying to make Christianity fit to Islam. They want to know what happened. How did you stumble across Islam and accept all the tenets and the teachings, and now you're Muslim? Well, uh, basically I had all of these unresolved questions in my mind. I believed in God as one God. I never believed in the Trinity. I believed in Jesus Christ as a man, mm -hmm. and as the, the man, you know, the second to last, the one who predicted the final prophet. And I didn't believe in him as God or son of God. Uh, I believed in the chain of prophethood. I believed uh, in the mercy of our Creator. And I believed that our Creator would not leave mankind without guidance and without definitive guidance. Guidance that, once a person saw it, is easy to understand and easy to make part of your life. Um, I gave up on Christianity. Mm -hmm. I studied and studied and studied until the point where I, I, felt, uh, I felt hopeless, basically. I felt like I could not find any Christian sect that represented my beliefs. And a lot of you out there know exactly what I'm talking about. A lot of you out there are in the exact same position. You have studied, you have looked, you have certain beliefs, you know what I'm talking about. They, you have not been able to find a church that, that in its completeness embodies those beliefs. And I'm just, I'm just telling you that when I studied Islam, when I learned about Islam, read the Holy Quran, I read a book by Martin Lings called Muhammad, his life based on, on the earliest teachings. And those books just clarified everything for me. That's when I became Muslim. So Dr. Brown, now uh, you're Muslim. Tell us, you know, many people, they assume that, you know, a Muslim is someone with a, uh, well, you do have a beard, but a, 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 a turban. <laughs> I, I uh, didn't always. Uh, <laughs> someone from living in, in um, Arabia, well, you do live in Arabia. <laughs> but tell us uh, some of these stereotypes, some of these misconceptions people have. I'm sure you've dealt with them, but, you know, when we look at you, you're a doctor. You know, you look like a, a, a very uh, uh, well-dressed, uh, well, um, uh, uh, intelligent human being, you know, who you know, wants what everyone else wants. Tell us, you know, some of the misconceptions that people have and how this is far from the truth. Can you share some of these things that you've come across? And I, think, I think the easiest way I can put it is the observation of one of my Muslim friends. Uh, when they, came to, uh, when they came to the West and saw how we were living in America and how we were living in England, they just said, everything's upside down. And uh, I can't put it better. Everything I feel is 
exactly upside down to my understanding. Mm -hmm. You know, in the West, in the West, Islam is portrayed with a media bias that is no mystery to anybody who has studied it. Uh, we, we're, we were raised, I was raised, to believe that Muslims were a bunch of towel-headed terrorists riding camels out in the desert, yeah. planning, on, planning on how next they're going to destroy Western civilization. And, uh, and uh, it, it was only learning about Islam as its true teachings are, and coming to know Muslims and living amongst them, that I just found out, as I said, everything's just upside down. Look, you find good and bad people everywhere. You can't avoid that. You find good and bad people everywhere. And it's from the bad people, it's from picking up on the example of the bad people that the media can spin things any way it wants to. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, the vast majority of people in all walks of life are basically good people. Um, they basically want the same things. They want to, they want to go to bed at night, knowing that they have a, a peaceful night ahead of them with, uh, you know, in the security of their homes, that they're not going to be a, a attacked in any particular way. They want to wake up to a morning of, of hope and promise where they can, they can go out and earn a, a decent livelihood for their family. They want to kiss their kids and send them off to school knowing that, that they're not going to uh, face any kind of uh, persecution or, or, um, or, or problems, you know, either going or coming. They want to have a normal life. That, that is the vast majority of all humanity. You get a few bad people, the media grabs a hold of that and spins it the way they want to. And what I found was just that. I just found that everything I had ever heard was media spin, just trying to make Islam look bad. Um, and the real truth was that uh, I, just, I just found that Muslims were my family. Uh, the vast majority of them, I felt, have softer hearts, uh, better manners, uh, just, just more kindness and, and more of that uh, humanity that I was looking for. In, in the West, in the West, to me, things are getting harder. People's hearts are getting hardened. They're not as generous with one another. Um, the kindness, the kindness is, is disappearing. Materialism is taking over. Uh, the tensions, the tensions of, of the rat's race of life in the West is controlling people. And I just found amongst Muslims the exact opposite. I, I found these things I told you and, and more. And uh, the living example of Islam, the living example of Islam is an example of modesty. It's an example of kindness generosity, truthfulness, and most of all, it, it's, the, it's the example of submission to our Creator. And that to me is life the way it's supposed to be lived. It's very simple. I'd like to thank you, Dr. Brown, for being with us. My pleasure. You can visit Dr. Brown at leveltruth.com? Uh, leveltruth.com or eighthscroll.com. Eighth scroll is spelled exactly as the book. E I G H T H S C R O L L dot com. And I'd like to thank you for tuning in to another episode of The Dean Show. I hope you've enjoyed this week's show with Dr. Brown. You've got to learn about Islam coming to the source. Islam simply means submission and surrender to one God alone, submitting to Him on His terms. And a Muslim is one who does the action of Islam. And now, from here, if you've enjoyed what we got, we had to say continue to come back every week here on the Dean show you can contact me if you have any questions you can also contact uh, Dr. Brown if you're interested in any of his books and we hope to see you next time here on the Dean show until then assalamu alaikum peace be unto you Allah there's only one God and Muhammad is his messenger Allah La ilaha illallah Allah There's only one God and Jesus was his messenger Allah La ilaha illallah Allah There's only one God and
Moses was his messenger, Allah, la ilaha illallah. Allah, there's only one God, and Abraham was his messenger, Allah, la ilaha illallah.